Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second webinar in our advising webinar series. This is Lisa Feldman talking. Um, and I do want to acknowledge, I think I'm the only voice you can hear. We do not have any feedback loops or technical issues this time. Um, so I'm Lisa Feldman in the room with me, uh, broadcasting from 2850 Telegraph, uh, is Doug Au from the student records team and Jocelyn Newman, Tamara Lawson, and Janet Guestavino from the training team. <clears throat> this, excuse me, this webinar is being recorded um, so that you can watch it again later um, or your colleagues can watch it again later. And I do want to thank you for the challenge, for dealing, for um, sticking with us through the challenges from the first webinar. Um, I recognize that uh, the video quality on playback was not as good as we would have hoped, and we are working on the technology for that to improve. So I want to acknowledge this is the webinar on the student enrollment experience. The focus is on the student experience of enrollment. That it, we won't go very deeply into the nuts and bolts on the back end. Um, I can tell you the policies that we've had on campus for the most part, um, all the policies around what students what what works you know what happens with student classes those really haven't changed it's the student experience that's really changing and as knowledge professionals our goal here is that you have the knowledge you need to address student questions and we want you to know what students are seeing so you the questions you want to ask consider phrasing them in the form of a question in that Let's think about what the students are going to ask you about enrollment as you see their experience. So we can, in addition to providing you with knowledge about what's happening with enrollment, we can actually even help you start to get to the answers to their questions. With that, I will turn it over to Tamara for the agenda. Thank you, Lisa. In today's agenda, we will present an overview of the SIS project, an overview of Go Live 5.0 to 5.7, student enrollment experience, and then we will take questions. And then we will talk about the wait list, and then we will take more questions. Before we be begin, when you want to ask a question, click the chat tool on the right side of your screen. Type your comment in the chat box and press the enter key. Now for Lisa Feldman. Um, thank you. And what we want to do before we even go into the details of the student experience of enrollment is review what the SIS project is about and what's changing. And some of you heard this last time, some of you have heard this before, but we always want to review it for people who have not heard it yet. Um, so the SIS project is providing a single integrated database for many of the activities having to do with the student experience. Bare facts, DB2, DARS, MyFinAid, and many things are going away. Um, and students will be getting a dashboard. And staff and faculty will be getting a dashboard in Cal Central. Um, this is a chart that um, many of you have seen on the advising, um, academic advising training webpage. And it shows the student experience and what advisors are going to be able to do and what the dates are for each of these. Um, and you can review this in more detail on the training website. So how is this going to be communicated to students and else partnership with the Academic Senate, messages and redirects on existing websites, postcard distribution, tabling in town halls, user acceptance training for students on March 15th and April 12th, for undergrads, partnerships with ASUC and Cal Student Central, and for all students via advisors. What's changing student enrollment processes? Cal Central is the entry point. Telebear's appointments are the same staggered start times and the change appointment window does not close until the next phase begins. Schedule Builder tool is switching to Schedule Planner, and there's time conflict enforcement. Students cannot register for two classes that meet at the same time. This includes going on a waitlist for a class college waitlist managers can override.
So, and I understand that some of you may be having sound issues, but some of you are not having sound issues. Um, so there may be an adjustment you need to make on your computer to unmute the sound on your computer, but you can't hear me say this if this is true. Okay, so um, <laughs> I, um, for, I actually wanna back up to what Janet was just talking about, the changes for, uh, for students um, with the enrollment process and really acknowledge this is really big. After 30 years or more, telebears is going away. So stepping way back, um, this is a really big change for the students and for campus. Um, and we're going to go into a piece of it today, but just wanted to put it in perspective. Also, I wanted to put in perspective um, the timeline and methodology for this project. Many of you have seen this. Um, until the first four phases of this project, and you can see the phases across the top, have focused on admissions. And we have been preparing for students starting in the fall of 2016 to experience everything in the new SIS and not be part of our legacy systems. So that is where we have been to date. Starting with the go live that is next Tuesday, March 22nd, a lot changes for students on campus. Um, the light green bar is the student self-service experience or the Cal Central experience. And students will be experiencing enrollment, budget and payment and many other things through. In addition, starting next week, advisors will begin to see their own new dashboard in Cal Central. And then we have um, further go lives in August and September when we are building on all of these tools. I do wanna review a little bit of lingo. Many of you know this already, but I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page here. Campus solutions versus Cal um, It's a PeopleSoft product, and it is what people who are managing enrollments, the nuts and bolts of enrollment are gonna be working in. Cal Central is where all students are gonna to go to access all of our SIS activities and where advisors will access advisor tools. The other piece of lingo I wanted to remind us of is Cal Student Central versus Cal Central. Cal Student Central is where the people are. It's the drop-in help desk for primarily undergraduate students while Cal Central is the portal. And with the uh, portion of our webinar is the student enrollment experience and uh, presented by Jocelyn Newman on the SAS project training team and Doug Ao on the SAS project records team. Take it away. Hi, I'm Jocelyn Newman, SAS trainer uh, here at down at 2850. And I want to take you through a tour of some of the student enrollment pages as students will see them in Cal Central. So on the Cal Central dashboard, um, they're going to have a bunch of different things. We're going to go through to my academics, to the schedule of classes. But just so you know, what I'm about to show you is currently available on the SIS project website under training and under advising, and there's a video available. So this is what a student will see when they click on my academics for uh, in Cal Central. And we have... Is that Yep, that's the okay. laser pointer. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just trying to get the laser pointer here. So my academics will be up on the top here. You see all of this information, and then the students will have this class enrollment card. So one of the first things they see is meet advisor. So what that means, they'll they'll be notified if they need to make an appointment with you. They'll have a plan um, that will go link to schedule a planner. Then you see down on the bottom, this is their enrollment period. So their phase one and two appointments. But to get to the schedule of classes, we're going to click Explore, and then it will click to Schedule of Classes. Why is it not clicking? There. There we go. Okay. So we're going to click on Schedule of Classes to get to this next page. So students will be able to look up a class by the class number or they'll be able to use different search parameters. Now, if I bring your attention to the upper right side here, you'll see the, for the shopping cart, there is a green for open, blue square for closed, and a yellow triangle for waitlist. And I'll explain these in just a moment. 
So the open, that means that the class section shows as open if any spot is open, even if a spot is reserved for a specific type of student. The yellow triangle will show for the waitlist if the section is full, but there are still waitlist spots left. Then the blue square for closed indicates that both the class section and the waitlist are full. So in this example, our student has chosen Geography C82, and they've, you can see here that they've chosen the lecture uh, section 001. Then if there are secondary classes, as, like, as in these discussion sections, they will be, um, they will be directed to select them. We'll click next, move on to the next page. So the stu after the student chooses all class components, a summary page displays their choices. So the original class setup dictates what options are available here. So this is your fall shopping cart. So you see that the students have their classes selected along with the secondary class sections and then whether it's open or not. So students will need to refresh this page to see any changes to the status icons as other students are enrolling before they get to their appointment. So to the next page. The students can finish enrolling and confirm their choices once their appointment window is open. Then the results page shows the status icon for successful or unsuccessful enrollment in each class. Please note here that the system will also indicate when a student is successfully placed on the wait list. Now in a more detailed view, the student can, will be able to see their enrollment status and also the waitlist position. The waitlist position number reflects the status for a combined enrollment in both the required lecture and discussion. So we so feel free to chat in your questions. So our first question from Jamie is, is this notification customizable? Some advisors have appointments and some have drop in only. So this is Lisa to answer the question. You were um, looking at the enrollment card on the student Cal Central page. Um, and it did have six steps, and the first one was meet with an advisor. Um, this is uh, it, this only appears as like you must meet with an advisor if there is a hold on the student, um, and so that's how uh, that's sort of an on-off thing. There are two options: either meet with an advisor, just regular, or meet with an advisor um, with a hold. And we are having on Monday. We are having a webinar on placing and removing holds, so you can see how you do that. And someone, uh, Marjorie, also asked, why is the square blue and not red? It's <laughs> a good question. We don't know. Yeah, that's yes. just campus solutions delivered. That's just how it is. Th that's the way it came. Okay. But thank you, Marjorie. And she also asked, who are college waitlist managers, or do you mean department schedulers? Uh, I can answer that. So, college, some college schedule, some of the college schedules, schedulers, sorry are also enrollment managers. Some advisors are enrollment managers, uh, but not all advisors or class schedulers manage enrollment. So people have multiple roles. If you are in um, LNS, uh, we have uh, enrollment managers throughout the, and waitlist managers throughout LNS and the college, um, college advisors are also doing that. If you are in another college other than LNS, it's, it's whoever has been doing it before for you, like whoever has been involved with wait lists and working in OLADs, it's the same set of people. Okay. And will students be able to see their position on a discussion section wait list or just the overall lecture wait list? There is no such thing as a discussion section wait list. That's in, if you were used to actually seeing that in DB2, that is actually never ever been correct. 
So any <laughs> fantasies that you have that, that there was ever a discussion section waitlist is not right. Um, so that actually, and that is definitely going away because there is really just one waitlist for the entire class. If you get in when your position on, on the overall waitlist comes up, if there is a space in the discussion, you will get in. If there is not a space in this discussion that, or the secondary that you've chosen, you will not get in. That's just how it, how it works, and that's actually how it worked in DB2 as well. You may have thought that students had had a, a place on the discussion waitlist, but that is that got jumbled every time we ran the waitlist. So, trust me, it was never correct if you were going by that. And how will students know course numbers? Can you demo search more? So, uh, so the. The, the, the class number, actually, the class number is basically the same as a CCN. Students in, in, the, in the class search um, can search by class and it'll show the class number. They never actually need to know the class number. Um, they could all, once they, they search for a class, they could actually just go from there and adding it to their shopping cart. But if they, if they, if you know a class number and that's the specific one you want to distribute to a student, you can. Students don't necessarily need to know it unless they, you know, unless they're, you know, you just wanted to provide a shortcut for them to try to get to the class. Doug, so. can I follow up by asking if the student knows the name of the class but not the number, how do they find the So number? in the class search, they can search for it and it will display in the search results. So you can put in a, a search term, yeah. not just the number. Yeah. Okay. And you can also just search by subject. Okay, great. So what I'm showing on the screen here is just a, 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 a sorry, a, a page that shows the student what the class number is. So if you were to give them the class number or they were to look in the schedule of classes prior to the shopping cart being available, they would be able to clearly see this number. And as Doug said, this class number is a new terminology that replaces the CCN number that you're used to, but it's the same thing, just a different yeah. functionality. Yeah, however, in CS, they, once you once a student searches for a class, they can just add that class directly to their shopping cart without ever actually knowing the class number itself. Even though it's there and they can use that, it's not, it's not, you know, it's just a shortcut okay. in CS. And Marjorie wants to clarify, all schedules, all schedulers can bypass the time conflict for students. Is that correct? Absolutely not. <laughs> so if you if you are also an enrollment manager and you want to issue an override if you so if you if you actually are managing the enrollment for a class so not everyone who is a scheduler is also an enrollment manager but if you, if you have both roles and you you wish to allow a student to enroll in a class with a conflict you may issue an override and that override one of the check boxes in the override is to override um, time conflicts you can do that but you have, that's a specific action you have to do, and you can either issue a student specific permission, or you can issue a, a class, uh, or uh, you can issue a, a basically what what's a, 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 an entry code, like what we used to do. But that's what you have to do to get the student in the class, and that's actually for another enrollment training that you should go to if you are an enrollment manager. Right, right. So starting next, starting week, tomorrow, starting tomorrow. This is already next week. This is next week. Uh, start, so this is Jocelyn. Uh, starting tomorrow will be enrollment and waitlist manager management training. And those of you who have had access in OLADS prior, who have been able to prior to now uh, to adjust enrollment controls or um, adjust wait lists, such things, you should have gotten an email from me. And if you have not, if you have not received it, if you have a departmental email, check that because sometimes we have that on it. And if not, e go ahead, please email me, newmanj at berkeley.edu. How soon after new student SIR, SIRs do they have access to my academics tab? So they, <laughs> so I <laughs> Once they once they're onboarded, they will have access to the to Cal Central and the My Academics tab. However, they are not because we're now all in one integrated system. They will be on the admission side until admissions passes them over to us. They don't. I believe they're not planning on doing that until mid-May, 
once they pass the students over, we will run um, term activation and enrollment appointments for the students. So you'll see that around mid-May or so. So even though the third deadline is in is um, um, at either end of April or the first of May, um, you you still won't see the students will actually not have an appointment until about mid-May. Okay, and will students be able to request any available discussion section? Yes, absolutely. Unless you know, if it's available, it's available. You know, unless you know, again, you could have you could have requirement groups or reserve capacity set, but that's another topic for another day. Okay. <laughs> How can a student figure out which discussion section has the shortest waitlist? I don't know if they can see that. I don't believe you can see wait how many people are on the wait list for a class. Okay. Um, will the online schedule of classes still remain on the website so that students can see all the department offerings? There is a delivered schedule of classes and that it will be out there. Um, and so, you, you know, what, again, we, we, we kind of went directly into into CS and did a little demo earlier, but you can, you actually, um, when the student under class, um, under, was it class search? There's, there, you can actually go to class search in Campus Solutions and search for, for all classes that are available. Um, there's also going to be a schedule planner that will be out there and that will also list all, all the classes. And someone asked, what should we be calling this system? The question we get every time, the answer is Cal Central. We want to not be confusing people with lots of different systems. So students will start in Cal Central for everything. So it's called the enrollment system. It doesn't have a name that starts with Cal or Bear. <laughs> <laughs> How will concurrent extension students enroll? Concurrent or an extension students. Concurrent students will still continue to go to concurrent and through extension to start their process. Um, we like we are still in the planning stages of getting their enrollments into CS, but that that actually will come at a later go live. Um, and, and so again, they're still going to go to extension because th their enrollment is managed through extension, so they have to start there. Okay, since we don't know whether or not a student will drop one of the courses with the time conflict, shouldn't we bypass the time conflict for all students on the wait list? Absolutely not. <laughs> we are not allowing students to enroll in time conflicts. If you want to issue individual bypasses for every student on your time conflict, you can do that. There is a new functionality in Campus Solutions called Swap. Um, so in in addition to add and drop, there is a swap function. The swap can will allow a student to, to say, I want to swap this class for another class. And so if if they they use that function, it will not drop the class that they're waitlisted or enrolled in until the add transaction is successful. So that is a that's a new function that, that we're gonna get, but you know, as a result, we are not allowing all the students to automatically enroll in classes with time conflicts. Since we don't know whether or not a student will drop one of the courses with the time conflict, shouldn't we bypass the time con conflict for all students? On oh, no, I That's just asked that. I'm <laughs> sorry. If they can't see open seats in a discussion lab section, how do they know to choose an open section and ultimately enroll in the class? No. What, as the options on the list, they, they'll only get to actually select the ones that are that have open seats. Not, yeah, they'll, they'll still all the all the secondary sections will still have those same icons that you saw earlier of green, yellow, and blue. So, if if it has a blue square, it's not open. <laughs> if it, if it has a green square, it's selected. <laughs> if it is open, it will have a, a green circle. And mm -hmm. if the wait if the wait list if the class is is, is complete the registration for the class is complete and a wait list has begun, it will have the yellow triangle on it indicating to the student that they would be going on the wait list for this class. So Kay wants clarification for any available. She said, I meant to, I meant could a student ask the system to enroll them in any available section as opposed to asking for a specific se section? No, the student must select one. And is schedule builder or schedule builder functions will still exist? GPA distribution, question mark? Um, so schedule builder is actually being replaced with something called schedule planner. 
Um, and, um, and the GPA distribution piece is something that we have not uh, implemented yet and are working on, in fact, in partnership with the Student Technology Council. How about OLADs for graduate students or manual enrollment for graduate students? Will we still need to do that? <laughs> you shouldn't have ever had to do this. You should tell your graduate students, unfortunately, to, gra to enroll themselves. Um, they, if you choose to, if you choose to use the enrollment system to to enroll the graduate students, you must go through training. You must have access to, in order to do this. You have to submit an enrollment request. It's you know, it's if that's how you want to do it, that's what you have to do. Um, we really um, in the, in our new campus solutions, students will not get get um, a bill, they will not receive charges until they enroll. So as part of this big change in our new system, these students will not get financial, will not have any fees and will not have any financial aid unless they enroll. So we really suggest graduate students start enrolling themselves. So do we just say <laughs> register in Cal Central? There are so many other things to do on Cal Central. Does this enrollment system have a name? Oh, and, we, and I answered that to Leah online. We actually, you can say register under my academics in Cal Central, and we acknowledge that's a lot of words. Um, but it will become obvious to students once they start using it. Will schedulers management enrollment in campus solutions? Scheduling management. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The answer is yes. Schedulers, schedulers and enrollment managers will manage enrollment in Campus Solutions. So Campus Solutions, informa the information that you'll be using in Campus Solutions will show to students as Cal Central. So when you're speaking with students, you want to use Cal Central as what the students are seeing. They will never see the words Campus Solutions. Will the maximum 10.5 units for phase one and 16 units maximum for phase two still be enforced in the system? As for for 2016-17, for fall 2016 and spring 2017, yes, we will still have these limits. They are actually hard limits now. So unlike the soft limit um, where a student, you know, could go over that number um, if if they weren't over it, it's now a hard limit. So once you know, if you are in 14 units and you want to add a, another three unit class, you cannot. How do students know how to select the selection, the section with the shortest wait list if they're not able to see the number of students on the wait list per section? Will this information still be available on schedule.berkeley.edu? Schedule.berkeley.edu is going away. Um, we, I, be, I believe that you may be able to see this information in schedule planner, so students might be able to see the see waitlist um, in counts in schedule planner, but not um, they're not going to see it. I don't believe in the delivered cost schedule. System allows students to enroll in a course in which they previously received a pass or a letter grade of C or higher. C minus, I think it's it. Oh, C minus. Sorry. Yeah. If the repeat rules allow a student to enroll in the class, they can enroll. If so, it all really depends on 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 whether repeat is allowed at the course level for that course. So, so whatever it you you had um, actually selected in CMS and we brought over into the new system, um, if if repeat. If the repeat says no repeats allowed and the student got a passing grade, no, the student cannot enroll, enroll in that. Okay, and someone said, sorry to ask this again, but you're saying that a student will know they are waitlisted for a class, but, but not know if they are number one or number 267 on the wait list. Oh, no, they will know. Sorry, they will know their position. Um, as Jocelyn showed um, in, the, in the enrollment details, they will see what position they are in, but what? But we're saying that that on the waitlist itself, before you actually get on the waitlist, you can't see what position you may wind up being, okay. right? Until you complete the transaction, you won't know. 
And if we allow students to have advisor holds, will this delay their enrollment or do the advisor holds provide an access code to register for classes and keep others out? No, there is no longer an, uh, uh, an access code. If there is a, so, so I believe that many of the department's um, advisors have been um, Christina Gakutan and the um, advising, um, the academic advising team to specify whether they want to put enrollment holds on their students for advising. So if you say that, then there will be an enrollment hold and the, and you actually have to, to either manually or in a batch release those in order for that student to enroll in classes. Are the all course-wide restrictions viewable by students somewhere? There are no longer course-wide restrictions. We do have enrollment requirements, but we are not allowing anyone to put in. So basically, course-wide restrictions in DB2 were something we put in place as, as something to sort of enforce enforce um, prerequisites. Now, CS actually, the new system will allow us to enforce prerequisites, but because our prerequisites need a lot of cleaning up, if you ever look at it at a cross section of, of, of prerequisites <laughs> that we have, they are all over the board and most of them are, or I would say not most of them, but I would say a good number of them are not something that we have data on and can enforce. So until we click prerequisites clean, cleaned up, we are not putting seat reservations. And if you go to the training that's happening over the next few weeks, you will learn how to place seat reservations. The only, the only, the only prerequisite that we will put on courses at the get-go are RNC. So only reading and composition, only entry-level writing requirement for RNC courses is is going to be um, enforced at at. Um, for fall 2016. Okay, I want to make sure I get Nancy's question. So in what way will concurrent enrollment or UC extension folks be able to see the schedule of classes and can advisors see the schedule of upcoming classes? And Marjorie asked a similar question is if there isn't, you know, scheduled at berkeley.edu, how do advisors and others see these? Um, if we want to tell the staff or the public what classes are being taught, um, and I do know that the advisors will have on their dashboard a link to the schedule of classes within our system, but how else will people see it? Is there another way others can see it? So at, at go live and probably not until July, you will not be able to see the schedule of classes unless you have access to the system. There is no public facing schedule of classes. There is something being built right now by um, by Johanna Metzgar in the in the office of the registrar. That's another tool that will be out there, and that that will, that will be the public facing schedule of classes. Is that how concurrent enrollment and UC extension people will then see it? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we could always provide someone with a with a we could always provide a, a hard copy list or a PDF list, but right now there is no public facing schedule of classes. Okay. Thank you. Jocelyn, are you ready? I think we might be ready. Okay, I'm gonna try this here. The shared screen and did PowerPoint. All right, that looks very complicated. Okay, so are we on? We're on, great. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about reserving seats. So when um, Doug said the words earlier, reserve capacity and requirement groups, uh, some of you already know what I'm talking about because you've been a class scheduler and you've been setting these sort of things up. But basically what we're talking about is what used to be called enrollment reservations. And so a reserve capacity is setting up a group, a requirement group is a specific type of, pe of people. And when you come, uh, those of you who haven't done class scheduling, but you're going to be doing enrollment, when you come to the enrollment management class, we'll go into this in a lot more detail than we will here, but I just wanna give you an overview so you have an understanding of what this, um, what this looks like, and especially when students come to you and say, why can't I get into this class even though I see that might be an open seat? So I'm gonna tell you. So um, for the sake of our example here, we're gonna have a class of 20 people, 
total. And these 10, first 10 seats in orange are going to be reserved for, say, the department's major. And then we have five seats in the blue that are reserved for a group of students called new undergraduate transfer. And then five seats are open to anyone. Turn off the laser pointer here. And so, so now we're going to start to look at the students as they enroll. So the first student that comes along to enroll is a new undergraduate transfer student, but not a major. So this, uh, the system is going to first look at, is the student a major? No. Is this student a new transfer student? And then, um, and then take that seat. So the second one student is a major, so they'll take that first seat. Third student that comes along is neither a major nor an undergraduate transfer, so they'll get one of the open seats. Now I have a fourth student comes along that is both a major and an undergraduate transfer, and this has to do the, with the order in which you set up the groups. In this example, the student gets that. So then the rest of the students will come along and take up all of these seats. So now we go to the wait list. We're gonna take a look at the students on our wait list. And while this is happening, so the students first sign up and then a student drops. So the student that dropped is a new undergraduate transfer student. But if we look at our wait list, the first student on this wait list is not a major or an undergraduate transfer. And this is where you're going to get that question you're gonna get the question of, hey, I see that this seat is open, but I'm not getting promoted into that class. And it's because the system will actually look at that student and say, you don't meet the criteria for that reserved seat, and it will go to the next in line. So the second student is an undergraduate transfer student and not a major. So this person ends up going into that seat, and then the class is full again. So that's the basic basis of how the wait lists work. So I think we will now take some questions. Um, we have, I'm sure you have plenty. Sound issues. So someone oh. wants to know if you can repeat the last few lines. Okay, last few lines. Uh, okay, so we have the, the classes. Everybody's enrolled. And then we're going to look at the wait list. And so the wait list is not a major or an undergraduate transfer. So normally they would go into the five seats that are open to all. So a student drops, but the student that drops is not actually one of the new undergraduate transfer and they are reserved for that seat. So the first student on the wait list who is not a major or an undergraduate transfer does not get in. That's where you're going to get the question. Why can't I get into this class if there's an open seat? Because they might see the open seat for a couple hours in between the time the student drops and the process is run to promote the wait list. But in this case, what will happen is the set system will go to the second student, look at that they're a new undergraduate transfer and then put them into that seat and the class becomes closed again. Okay. The wait list process seems similar to before, is that correct? It's similar, yes. however, I would suggest that there is a, there is an, uh, a way to turn off the automatic process, but you should not touch that because in Campus Solutions, in the, in the scenario that, that um, Jocelyn just described, if you had the waitlist set to manual and that seat opened up before the waitlist processes, processes, and if a student came in and you had that, that class set to manual, a student who matches the criteria could get in ahead of students on the waitlist. So, Okay. You, but go to training because you will see how how enrollment reservations and, and wait lists will work more in more detail. How do we reserve a seat for an extension student that the department invites to the campus? So um, we actually we would have to set up a category if there is a way for us to if there is a way for us to to, to um, identify that student, we can do that. If you are actually really reserving, um, reserving a seat for a very specific student, I would say you can issue a student-specific permission 
whether that be a permission number or a student specific one, you can issue that and allow only that student to enroll in the class. Okay, and will there still be a manual option for waitlist management? Like I said, you can put on manual, but I would be very careful because once you put on manual, you if someone drops and a seat opens up, even if you have a waitlist, someone else who comes in before the waitlist processes can't get in ahead of everyone on the waitlist. I, you know, that's just something we discovered that, that, that happens in CS. So I would suggest you not turn off the automatic web processing. And Jocelyn, will you be covering this in training? I will be covering this in the enrollment and waitlist management training. Great. Okay. And how often will the waitlist process? We are planning to run it twice a day. We can actually absolutely run it more often if needed. And that's something that that, that we likely will do. We're, we're, we're actually talking about running it three or four times a day. Okay, and can we make, for example, a declared major and a new undergraduate transfer? Because this scenario means any new yes. undergraduate transfer, regardless of major, can take seat. Absolutely, but you you cannot create the requirement group yourself. DB2 allowed you to put these 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 variables into this or to set these variables in the in the enrollment reservation screen. Each and every requirement group needs to be coded. So you need to actually make that request. You can see a list of, of everything that's already out there. Um, if you go to tinyurl.com slash REQ dash group. Tinyurl.com slash REQ. That website, there is actually, there's something new in there called terms and attendance that's also described on a, on, a, on a worksheet. And as you can see, we, there's also a, a worksheet on every, every plan, which is similar to a, to a major code that you had, but it's actually major code crossed with a degree goal. So you have to tell me everything that you want if you want to cross any of these lists to be created. Yes. Tell Doug Ow. Yes. <laughs> Tell Doug Ow because you, you, and so, if you could But first you should go to tiny URL. Yes. And make sure you see what you see there. Yes. And if something seems to be missing, contact Doug. Yes. So so that means that yes, you can have a group created for you that combines new undergraduate transfer with major. declared major, but you have to ask for it. So just look through and see what you need. Yes. And contact Doug. And go to training because you'll, training. you'll, you'll we'll see. Talk about it more. Yes, enrollment um, seat reservations work very interestingly in the new system. Sequences matter, and also you can set things to expire. So yes, use that. It's <laughs> yes. Good. Can seats be reassigned to open seating if they are not used by reserve seating groups? That's what I just mentioned. So you can actually set it so that it expires on a certain day. So um, any any seat reservations you set, um, I would suggest you know like expire them on the first day of instruction or something so that you know and have them all go go back to open seats so that other people can get in okay and if a class that has not filled has open seats but only seats reserved for majors what can enroll and are unable to do so <laughs> you want to hear me? Uh, they will see a message that says that they do not meet the requirement for this so for this class, so the, I'm going to have actually for you probably in the next day or so, we'll put online a list of the student messages that they will get. So they'll you'll see what the message that they get specifically, uh, the error message that they get if they don't meet the, the requirements for the class or if they get on the wait list or other conditions in Cal Central. And when you say put that online, that will be on the advisor, At training, the advisor page training page under this student enrollment section. So you can see we have a number of things there, including other views of the student enrollment experience. And um, we will continue to put documents that explain things about the student enrollment experience in that location. So follow up with the previous question. If they are not currently a student, how do we hold the spot until the student is able to register? Um, if they're not currently a student and you want to hold a spot, um, I would suggest 
Go ahead, actually, Johnson. Please. I was going to say uh, the res the requirement group of the enroll enrollment. enroll permission only. Yes. Concurrent enrollment question. This was yes. a CE student. So so in the requ in the requirement groups and. Uh, uh, so in the requirement groups, and this is something that the class schedulers can adjust and fix. There is a new requirement group. Uh, it's the number is four zeros five five is the code, and it's called per enroll permission only. And so you can use that reserve capacity, that reserve group, and reserve the seats that no student can match, and that's how you can hold the seats. So we've created a requirement group that no one meets. So that you can actually hold some seats and then you can release it once the student is enrolled. What about switching sections? Is that manual process? So switching sessions, yes, it is a manual process. You actually basically have to go into the system and process a, an enrollment request, just like doing an add and drop. It's actually very similar to an add drop process. You actually have to process the whole thing, drop and add. I would suggest that you either give the student a permission or something and have the student do it themselves. And I will be going over this in the enrollment and waitlist uh, trainings. Okay. Well, we have the options of AL, locking a course so that only enrollment managers can manage waitlists. No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> there is no, no L function in this system. So, and I, I can tell that there are people who actually are enrollment managers on this call. Yes. Um, and I do want to encourage everyone to share information with your colleagues. You yes. have advisors who work with you um, who may have questions about this. Yes. And you're so these are good questions, and we want to make sure everyone yes. is sharing so this information. The, the only thing, the, the, what I would suggest you do is if that's what you want to do, to you would actually basically set the the entire enrollment, either set the entire enrollment in the class to enroll by permission only that's how you would manually manage it or you you or you you set the 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 um reservations to that reservation group that that um jocelyn just mentioned and hold all seats for that reservation group one or the other we have about five minutes left so will the system still restrict students from enrolling in no more than four units of 98 over 198 per term we are not doing that for fall 2016. Um, we actually will run checks and write reports um, out, and we will actually depend on, uh, we will actually be either, we can't actually really automatically drop the students because we don't know what, what which ones they would want to keep. We will, actually, we will likely write the report and send it to advisors, and then you can decide what to do from there. Where do we refer students back to the public if when they can't find the information they are looking for, including but not limited to may be able to schedule number on wait list for discussion and everything else they are looking for um, access to as they are used as they are used to it? What is the equivalent to the OSOC at berkeley.edu? So we would suggest that you contact <laughs> you. Um, so if it's the public or a student, I would suggest they, they contact Cal Student Central. They will be ha heavily trained to answer public questions. If you find a, a systems issue, um, I would I would suggest that you um, submit a, a ticket. Um, to syshelp at berkeley.edu. Um, that actually heads into our ticketing system. Please include as much information as you can about the student and the class and any ID numbers you happen to have. Um, it is syshelp, S-I-S-H-E-L-P, at berkeley.edu. Uh, is there one more question? Or we can wrap up. Okay, so uh, further on the locking question, we are in LNS and we always lock classes after the third week. What should we do from now on? You so you you you're locking classes after the third week of classes to prevent enrollment. Um, I would suggest again if you so you don't want anyone to add into the course after that. You can actually stop enrollment on the course. So there is a way in class get in the class to to stop enrollment if that's what you want. You can you can it, it's not canceling a course, but it's stopping enrollment. So uh, that question was asked by Leah Flanagan. 
So yes. we can also follow up offline with yeah. yeah. So we we can show you the exact place on the page where we can stop enrollment. And let's see our next question, which is one from previous. Um, after the third week, grad students did not have access to telebears and GSAOs had to manually make changes to enrollment in OLABs. Is this going away? So do so they will have access through the third week of enrollment and yes you they you would the students actually would have to ask get permission or or not get permission but, but would have to come to you to process their enrollments i think that's all the questions that we have for today you can always email us at sys training is there a hyphen in there sys dash training at berkeley.edu with thought with questions as well um, thank you so much for your questions, and we're actually collecting them and creating an FAQ knowledge base. And is this help at berkeley.edu just for staff or also? For I'm staff? actually typing the answer to that, but we can actually I'll answer that out loud. Sys help at berkeley.edu is primarily for faculty and staff. Any technical forget that. We want students to go to Cal Student Central if they have a challenge. Undergraduate students go to Cal Student Central. As you know, those of you who work in the graduate world, graduate students will come to you. Um, if you don't have the answer, then um, either you or the student could email us help at berkeley.edu. All right, I just want to say thank you to you all for participating today. Your process and where did my Berkeley app go? That's going to be March 21st from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. And on the same day, we also have advisor assignments and placing and removing holds. That's from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. Followed by March 24th webinar on reporting center and advisor queries from 1.30 to 2.30. Then we have two more webinars upcoming workflow GTE forms and transfer credit report, but we haven't scheduled those yet. We'll keep you posted. And uh, if you want to sign up for any of the webinars, do so at http colon forward slash forward slash sisproject.berkeley.edu forward slash training forward slash academic hyphen advising. Thanks again. <laughs>